Hi, it's Jodi, and this is Coffee Conversations, a show where we speak with inspirational women from around the world who are changing the status quo. On today's show, we have Rebecca Hodgson. She works for Project Waterfall, which is an organization very close to my heart and something which I'm also involved with. We're going to speak about how Project Waterfall uh, helps the coffee growing communities and their impact on young girls and women. So without further ado, let's get started. Hey, Rebecca. Hi, JD. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Okay, so I will just introduce you to our listeners and then we can uh, get going. So, Rebecca, obviously, I know you from working with uh, Project Waterfall and UK Coffee Week. That's kind of how we were introduced to each other. Um, You're the program manager for Project Waterfall. And over your time, you have brought over one million pounds to the coffee farming communities and have established Project Waterfall as a leading charity in the coffee sector. Um, That's much more impressive than the reality. (laughs) (laughs) No, not at all. It's definitely (laughs) uh, amazing work that you are doing. Um, So I guess to start things off, actually, first things first. I like to ask everyone this question. Um, What is your go-to coffee order? I'm a a black coffee kind of girl. Good, we like that. Simple, plain, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Perfect, I love that. Okay, so I guess we should start things off. How did you, um, how did you get into working for Project Waterfall? Like what was your um, journey into, into working within the nonprofit sector? And then, yeah, how did you, how did you get into working with Project Waterfall itself? That's a, that's a good question. And um, um, I've always wanted to work in kind of, um, well, not always wanted to work in the charity sector. I've always wanted to help people through my work or make mm-hmm. an impact through my work. Um, and I studied politics and international development, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to, to do after finishing uni. Um, I knew I wanted to work in the sector, but wasn't really sure what my, my job would look like or um, mm-hmm. what kind of organization I wanted to work for. And I met um, Jeffrey, who's our CEO, um, in a coffee shop uh, while I was writing my dissertation for university. Um, and we ended up just having like a really great organic conversation about um, about the sector, about challenges, about um, you know just all the kind of things that we were passionate about and believed in. Um, and at the end of it, he offered me an internship with uh, with Project Waterfall. Amazing. Um, and that was that was seven years ago, and I've just not left. So I'm <laughs> um, I do really yeah I love it there, and it's um, he's been a great mentor and. Um, um, we've kind of built Project Waterfall together, which has been really lovely. And, and it's been nice to work for a small charity where you can really make a big, a big difference and a big impact. For sure. It's interesting that you said when you were studying, you kind of knew that you wanted to get into the charity sector, but you didn't really know uh, where you wanted to go with it. I feel like a lot of the time, you know, people feel like it's a really linear um, transition into into doing what you want to do. You know, we kind of go through school, we pick our GCSEs, A-levels, go and study, and we kind of think it's all just going to, you know, seamlessly transition. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you feel like there is a, a path into that, into that charity and non-profit sector? I feel like um, a lot of people that I've spoken with that work within that sector, like, they all took very different paths or studied really different things like do you feel like there is an obvious path into getting to into it or you just kind of find yourself uh in that sector in the end um yeah no for sure i don't think there's there's no one path Mm -hmm. and there's so many different ways some people will have a full career in corporate or um doing something completely different and then come to charity later in life some people start off with charity and then switch over to to another sort of um remit um, I'd say that you know if you are looking to get into the sector and you're still in school or you're still quite young, volunteer as often as you can sure. um, while you're still living at your parents or you still have the support yeah. financially of um, <laughs> university loans and all those magical things. Um, it becomes much harder to do unpaid internships and things once you leave. Um, so take advantage of that and try as many different types of charities as you can. Like I, you know when when I was at uni or in school, I volunteered for so many different types of organisations, and you really see the breadth of different roles out there. And you sure. won't even scratch the surface with it, but there's 
you know, that you could work for kind of grassroots organizations, very small charities where you need to be very flexible and be able to do like a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, or you could work in a much more structured kind of corporate foundation, which is more um, to do with kind of like grants and things like that. Um, or you could go down the route of working for like non-governmental organizations and much bigger structured charities mm -hmm. where you've got a very precise role. Um, and what I would say is that all of these charities, some people I think think, me included, that the path into working for charity is to study something like international development or yep. human rights, and those are great things to study. Um, but actually, these charities need lawyers, accountants, marketeers, salespeople, people with MBAs. Like, you need a huge skill set of, um, like, a pool of skill sets to, to be in the charity sector. And we need more talented people that have done different types of, of journeys to come into the sector because. Um, if you just end up with a charity that's run by 200 people that all had the same background, then you're never going to have um, real, real impact and change. So yeah, diversity is good um, in, in what you study. A hundred percent. That's really important. Um, so I guess tell us a little bit about um, about Project Waterfall, what they do. Um, yeah, the the impact they've had. Um, obviously, we've discussed it. it they work within um, coffee farming communities. Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit of a bit of background about Project Waterfall. Sure. So, um, Project Waterfall is quite a small niche charity, mm -hmm. and we are in the, in the coffee sector. So we we bring clean drinking water and sanitation to coffee growing communities. Um, we work with local delivery partners. So we are very much um, kind of like a fundraising body that. Um, our main mission is to kind of bring the whole industry together and um, the kind of the uh, I guess the, the end of the chain industry and um, so coffee drinkers coffee lovers coffee shops mm -hmm. at home coffee equipment all that kind of stuff and coffee growing communities I mean I could talk about this for ages but coffee growing <laughs> Please communities do. are, are very remote <laughs> um they're they're very remote and um, very um rural communities mm -hmm. um, and in and often is paired with having a lack of um basic human rights such as clean drinking water education and um, to the community is from cities and from infrastructure the more likely it is that that community is not going to have those basic and um, basic rights and basic human um yeah, human, human rights i guess and um, so yeah we we work in in those coffee communities and um, and just try and funnel money from the industry back into back into where they're getting their coffee from amazing um obviously Water is hugely important at this time, especially during um, this global pandemic that we're going through. How has COVID affected affected um, the charity, affected things on this end and on, on their end, I guess? Obviously, um, pandemics and, and deadly diseases are less new to them than they are to us. Um, but yeah, how has, how has COVID affected everything? Um, yeah, so it's had an effect like, on both ends, absolutely. So from this side of things, we have um, seen a massive impact on our fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, we typically fundraise through events. So our London Coffee Festival has been our biggest fundraiser for years. Um, and then we've got um, uh, also the coffee shops that fundraise for us. That's another kind of main pillar. And they've been really hardly hit um, mm -hmm. by the pandemic. And our festivals have been postponed till next year. So both of those income streams have been um, limited this year. Of course. Um, we did have quite a good year the year before. So luckily, we were in a good financial position coming into the year and we've been able to maintain our main project um, which is in the Jabi Tahan district of Ethiopia um, but we usually would have done two or three other projects outside of that one and we haven't um, been able to do any of those so there has been a big impact on the amount of work we've been able to do um, it's taught us on the plus side I guess if you have to look at silver linings it has taught us to be more resilient um, which is good so 100%. we've looked into we've spent the time to look into other ways to fundraise and looking into connecting more with coffee drinkers and things like that so um, so hopefully, yeah, going into 2021, we'll be in a much stronger position. Um, on the coffee farming side of things and the actual coffee communities, you're absolutely right. Um, infectious diseases, while it's quite a novelty for us here and it's a very new, um, very new thing for us to have to process and deal with, um, the communities that we work with are dealing with infectious diseases on a daily basis. So a lot of the work that we already did around sanitation was targeted at stopping the spread of all sorts of diseases sure. um, that you're carried in, carried in water. Um, and they're different on depending on each community. So um, we're very lucky, touch wood, 
with the, the main communities that we're working with. Um, the COVID hasn't reached them yet, but there have been cases in Ethiopia um, and it has impacted our work in terms of we've stopped um, traveling and out of the community, of obviously. Um, so delivery materials are a little bit delayed. Um, the timelines for the projects have become a bit delayed and the, the reporting has become a bit delayed, but that's not really that important as long as the work's happening. It doesn't matter if the reports come in a year or two later. And um, so, so yeah, it has had an impact, um, but it is something that through the work that we do, um, hopefully the communities are more and more prepared for it. And it's just, it just highlights even, even more that the issue and the fact that we really do need to make sure that these communities have access to clean drinking water, um, but also sanitation and hand washing facilities, because it's just so important. A hundred percent. I guess on the topic of, you know, uh, pandemics being a new thing or relatively new thing to the Western world, um, but really not a, a new thing to a lot of African countries. Um, I feel like there is a lot that uh, the Western world can really can really learn from um, countries that have been hit by these pandemics. And I think that also plays into, um, you know, Western cultures coming in and kind of having this uh, savior complex. Um, I think it's a huge issue within the charity sector and definitely something that needs to be um, spoken about and, and uh, yeah, conversations to be had. How do you think that, or how in your experience has it, uh, you know, affected us, like us going in and, and kind of bringing clean water into these communities is obviously um, an amazing thing. Um, but it does kind of play into the role of us coming in and, and, and saving people. How do you think that we can um, stop this? Um, how do you think that we can uh, open the conversation up and, and center more voices in, in those communities rather than us coming in and kind of uh, dictating to people how, how they should run things? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so that's one thing that um, we, uh, as Project Waterfall, um, we are not experts in for how sure. to build pumps or wells. I know nothing about um, the geographies of this these countries in terms of like where the right, um, you know, kind of like a uh, gravity springs would need to be mm -hmm. in order to bring the water into the community. That knowledge is totally within the community. And I think um, we have, I mean, I personally have so much respect for the amazing delivery partners that we work with. So just in terms of the structure of how we work, as a charity we fundraise so where our skill set is, is is getting money and, and and raising capital for these communities but then we fund projects and they are totally owned by the communities that we're that we're working with so um in ethiopia the local delivery partner is made up entirely of a team of ethiopians and um, we have some amazing you know super super talented people in that team that are able to actually really they've, they've lived this their whole life they've worked in development in these sure. countries their whole life they know their local community and their local culture much better than mm -hmm. than we ever would and i think just having that trust and and being you know the, the one thing that's really missing is the funding and that's where we can help but in, in everything else the, the skill set is there and i think our job as um as a charity in in the west is just to really highlight those voices and those local heroes those people that um have been working in this since they were 18 and they're now in their 50s and they've had their whole career literally trying to do good in their own country and there are so many of those people out there and so many of those great talented educated voices um that it's it's not a difficult job to do to to highlight that because um because yeah there's just so much good going on in the countries themselves. 100% and I think like you said it's really important that it is that partnership that give and take because I feel like yeah um yeah we have so much to learn from from their communities just as much as as we can bring in oh absolutely um, I was taught how to wash my hands properly by a six-year-old girl mm -hmm. in Uganda so <laughs> um, I was not doing it right <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like, no, I mean, that's a silly example, but no, for sure, there's so much we can learn. And, and we do every time I receive a project report from from any of our delivery partners, I'm fascinated and I always learn something new. Um, and that that exchange of knowledge is, is wonderful um, between between the communities. Oh, that's so, so good. So good. Um, so obviously, Project Waterfall do incredible things. But one of the biggest reasons that I really wanted to get involved um, aside from obviously everything linking in with coffee and bringing clean water was the effect that um, having clean water in these communities really has on the women and girls. Um, yeah, can you talk us a little bit through that? Um, yeah, that would be really interesting for sure. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something I'm super passionate about as well. So mm-hmm. I can talk about it for a long time. <laughs> right, stop me. Um, yeah, so there's, I mean, basically, when you bring clean water into a community, it really changes everything. Um, mm-hmm. You know, child mortality rates go down and the health of the community improves. But the biggest impact um, for, for most communities is on their women and girls. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, the first one I would say is that collecting water is a, it's a very difficult time intensive job and it's often a job that falls on women. So it's not a case of just popping out into the garden and filling up a jerry can with water. The the water sources are usually located quite far away from, from the homes of, of mm-hmm. these women and families. Um, and they could be walking for up to four or eight hours um, every day to go and collect this water. Um, and you have to do the long journey there they have to wait in the queue um to get the water and these queues are so long i mean if we feel, thought queuing during lockdown was was bad in the uk like this is these queues are taking you know kind of like three four hours for, for the women to actually get to the water source mm-hmm. um and then once they get there they've only got sort of one or two jerry cans to fill up so it might be like one um 20 liter jerry can they'll fill it up and then bring it back to the bring it back to the house, and that whole process um, takes takes can take a full day. Um, the water is heavy to carry as well. Mm-hmm. Um, a jerry can, a full jerry can, is about twenty kilos. Um, which, if you're not into weightlifting, it's 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 a lot. Um, it's a lot. the same as like a, <laughs> um, it's the same as a check in airport baggage allowance so if you think of like what you can take in a big suitcase that's the kind of weight that these women are carrying back uh with them on their backs or their heads um into the into their family home and then when you get it home it's it's not enough water you know it's it's a small right. amount um it's often not even clean um and they've got to use that for their washing cooking cleaning giving to their family and their children um so often they might have to do a second trip as well so it's it's a really time intensive thing so the first thing that getting clean water does in a community is it gives women their lives back and it gives them the gift of time which is um i think one of the most powerful things you can give to somebody um it's really all we have at the end of the day is like our health and our time so to be able to have time to spend on um you know even even just parenting or on um, starting your own business or on you know just um having hobbies or interests or education or all these kinds of things that we just take for granted that um you you need the time to be able to do them so that's that's kind of the biggest area of impact um and then i would say also um another massive area is on um young girls in schools so a lot of the projects we do are around um sanitation in schools and having toilet blocks in schools and it Mm -hmm. is so important to have access to a toilet when you're at school um because especially for young girls when they hit puberty and they start their periods um if you've not got a toilet at school there's a there's a lot of stigma around it so you would often just stay home for the week um due to the stigma of not not having anywhere to clean yourself um and but b there's also um like a real kind of danger around it as well so if um like a young girl has been at school all day and she's not had an opportunity to change her pad nowhere to wash up um and she's walking home and it's dark um and the, you know in a lot of these communities there are wild animals there are um you know all sorts of different things that could could impact her, her walk home as well and if you've got uh, it's, it's a bit you know whatever to talk about but if you've got blood in a pad that's been sitting all day and then you're walking through an area with wild animals that also right. puts you at risk too so there's there's the and if, if they're missing a week every month out of school that's kind yeah, of that really adds up has such an impact you know it puts mm-hmm. them it's a quarter of the school year it's it's a huge impact and it puts them behind their peers so what that does is reinf- like their male peers and it reinforces the stereotype that oh women aren't as smart as boys women shouldn't go to school um because they're not getting the same grades as boys look they're both going to school and the girls are are sitting are behind and it's because you know they're missing a quarter of the school year so having toilets in schools is something i'm super passionate about all all schools should have basic toilets and clean water um and giving women their lives back through through providing clean water closer to home so they can they can do other things with their time is also really important a hundred percent yeah um wow that's a sorry massive rant (laughs) no I know amazing I think it's so important I think it's something that um especially in the western world we hugely take for granted um simple things like having a toilet at school can impact a girl's life so hugely and um I'm like you I'm I'm hugely passionate about uh women's rights and especially girls staying in education you know they already face so many um hurdles along the way um so to put extra things in their way just um Mm. 
just doesn't make any sense. So if something is as as what we would think as simple um, as having clean water and access to toilets can can keep young girls in education, um, the the benefits of that are absolutely um, huge. Um, so yeah, I completely agree with you. I'm equally as passionate, and thank you so much for uh, delving into that and, and really. Um, yeah, opening up uh, all of that to our to our listeners. So, to wrap things up, I I'm asking people quick fire questions at the end. So I've just okay. got five quick fire questions. They're super simple. Um, cool. Nothing um, too difficult. So the first quick fire question is: Would you consider yourself more an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert. Me too. <laughs> Stickler for schedule or wave rider? Wave rider. Okay. What are you currently reading or watching? Oh, a lot. Um, I'm currently watching The Queen's Gambit. Um, okay, yeah, I've heard a lot about this. That. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very good. Um, and I just finished reading the um, Eleanor Ferrante series, the Neapolitan okay. novel, which are very good. Amazing. I already recommend. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna have to add that to my to my reading list. Um, what is your go to meal? A brunch. Yeah, I love like a good brunch. Anything yeah, with avocados. I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would give the same same answer. Brunch and a good coffee for sure. Yeah. Um, and finally, which is the most important question, tea or coffee? coffee obviously i couldn't say anything else you couldn't no we could not end on a bad note (laughs) um well rebecca thank you so much um for coming on and for having that chat with us um yeah i love obviously the work that project waterfall um are doing and it's it's hugely um important and i'm um yeah, super excited to, to be involved with, with a, uh, an organization that are doing so much good. And thank you so much for letting everyone know and enlightening us on, on some really interesting things, for sure. Well, it's great to have you involved as well. And thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, it's been lovely chatting with you. Lovely. Well, have a lovely day that you get back to work. I'm sure you have thank you. lots to be getting on with. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we will um, we'll definitely catch up soon. Great, awesome. For sure. Thank you so much.